Hi everyone, several weeks ago I showed an early version of my 5-axis 3D printer prototype. Well, I've come a long way since then. Good news is that the 5-axis are now working and I have made a bunch of tweaks to the design of various parts. Here is what I am going to share during this video. The electronics and wiring, a run through of setting up Clipper and Octopi, an overview of the changes I made to the prototype and the reasons behind them. Regarding the changes I made so far into Clipper's source code to add the extra axis, I will tackle that in the next video, so keep an eye out for that. Oh, and quick heads up. Previously, I called the two new axes U and B, but someone in the comments suggested A and B since they are rotational. That makes sense, but then thinking a bit more about it, the usual names are A, B and C for X, Y and Z rotations axes respectively. So, in this implementation, we are adding A and C. So I will refer to them as such from here onwards. Unfortunately, I didn't think that through that much during development and I have named my axes A and B in my code. Maybe I should add C as well and make sure that they are optional too. Alright, let's get started with electronics. I have chosen a 24 volt 30 amps power supply for this printer. I am using a brand new one because I discovered some damage inside the old one. It was still working in the old printer, but let's not risk it. Next, I've got a Duet 2 Wi-Fi board and a Duex expansion board. I purchased them a while back, and while more advanced versions are available today, those should suffice for my needs. That is because I am going to use a Raspberry Pi 4 to run Octoprint and Clipper. Octoprint, if you haven't stumbled upon it yet, is an open source software that installs into the Raspberry Pi and provides a 3D printer management tool. It lets you control and monitor every aspect of the printer remotely via a web interface. It is basically an interface between your 3D printer and your computer or device. And if you are unfamiliar with Clipper, let's summarize that it essentially does all the heavy duty calculations on the Raspberry Pi instead of the Duet board. This makes it substantially faster. The Duet 2 boards remain important to control the peripherals, although it's more of a passive interface that follows the Raspberry Pi's directives. Let's put it this way, printer control boards were traditionally in charge of executing complex and resource intensive calculations. Meanwhile, we were wasting computing capacity in the Raspberry by running only Octoprint. It wasn't long before someone smart realized that they could shift those calculations from the limited microcontroller to the Raspberry Pi, and then relay the pre-processed instructions to the microcontroller already cooked for their execution. Luckily, among the sample configurations, I found samples for my boards, even with expansion board into account, which simplifies my discovery work. Also, worth mentioning, I have integrated two external stepper drivers to handle those beefier motors, just as I promised. And here is where it gets interesting. Those drivers can handle up to 50 volts. Think about it, if I ever want to ramp up the motor's capacity, I could grab another power supply with the same specs, crack it open, tweak it to create a floating configuration and wire it in series with the current one. This could up the voltage to 48 volts, letting me power those larger motors with 48 volts instead of the current 24. I pulled this off previously with my CNC router and it worked like a charm. Please do notice that opening a power supply and tinkering with it can be dangerous. So do it at your own risk. One can electrocute or set something on fire while doing that. So it's a good idea to have a fire extinguisher at hand. I wonder, could I boost an EMA 17 with an external driver too? Feels like it may be doable, and maybe I can squeeze more performance from the same motors at the expense of probably heat? I was looking into my Bamboo Lab printer and noticed that the stepper motors run around 70 degrees, so I will keep that in mind as a baseline. The wiring was done in two parts. Initially, I connected the power supply to the boards and the external stepper drivers. Following this, I wired the Raspberry Pi and connected it to the external keyboard, mouse and monitor. Then I flash the latest available Octopi image, which comes preset with Octopi and several other useful tools, making it an excellent starting point to install Clipper. Once installed on the Raspberry Pi, Clippers let me compile the firmware for the Duet boards and flash it directly into it. At that point, I had the basics wired up and Clipper installed and flashed. I was able to establish a connection in Octopi, but later on I ran into connectivity issues. I ended up tracking it down to an end stop sensor not properly wired. One quick note here, after the fiasco of my last wiring work, I decided to invest in some specialized tools. I got myself some decent quality crimping tools and all sorted connectors. And it did save me a lot of time in the end. 
not to mention that it is more reliable when done right. I decided to test each connection one by one by powering on the printer after each new connection. However, I got complacent and didn't follow that approach while wiring the end stops. This mistake made me waste some time. I found some overcurrent warnings with the dimesh command and could no longer connect Clipper to the duet. But I could erase and flash new firmware and that threw me off for a bit. Ultimately, I decided to revert to a previous state where everything worked. That implied unplugging everything one by one until the problem goes away. Just by chance, the problem was traced back to the very last thing I tried unplugging, the seed end stop. The mistake was that I wired it incorrectly, with the ground and signal cables inverted. It could have been worse, I've tried plenty of electronics in the past in similar ways. Even after reconnecting the end stop correctly, the Raspberry Pi had a hard time recognizing the duet board in any USB port. I couldn't find any burn component and the same board was recognized by another desktop computer with Ubuntu installed on it. I ran out of ideas and to circumvent this problem, I connected the duet to the Raspberry Pi using the GPIO pins, employing RX and TX lines. I will provide a link to the wiring on a website I am working on, where I will share all things related to this project. I am halfway there with that. In the course of troubleshooting this problem, I decided to add a step-down converter that drops the voltage from 24 volts to 5 volts and delivers 3 amps. This enables me to power the Raspberry Pi from the main power supply by the GPIO pins 4 and 6, which is very convenient as I can now turn everything on with a single button. I believe the Duet 2 comes with an internal 5V regulator, but I won't rely on it to power the Raspberry Pi since it's probably unable to supply 3 amps. One more thing I tried was this new thermal camera I bought myself with the excuse of this project. It lets me visually check for any issue by looking for abnormally hot spots. Unusually hot parts are good indicators of future problems. Right now, everything looks cool enough. Let's jump into the software and the firmware. After setting everything up and enabling SSH protocol on the Raspberry Pi, it's possible to remotely access it, provided you know its IP address. One can find this by executing ifconfig in the Raspberry Pi terminal. The benefit on doing that is that you can then unplug all the devices from the Raspberry Pi and use it as a headless computer. You can connect via SSH from any OS. I am using Windows right now, which has a terminal with Ubuntu that I can use to connect. If I were using my Mac laptop, the terminal is native to the OS, like any Unix-like system, including Linux distributions. One of the steps I've taken into this project is to create the fork of the original GitHub repository to version control changes in my configuration and source code of Clipper. Although that is public in my personal GitHub account, I wouldn't like to share it just yet. Surely my superficial understanding of the code base made me make big assumptions, and I will figure out as I go what I did right and what I can do better. Eventually, I would like to be able to send the pull request to the authors, but I am not even close to that level of quality in my code just yet. Another tool I was using was CyberTag that lets you remotely replace files inside the Raspberry Pi using the same SSH protocol. But I quickly realized that the workflow needed to change. To simplify the language transition, I just went for PyCharm, which has a plugin to upload the source from my local computer to the Raspberry Pi by SSH with just a click. Notice though that my local files are linked to the GitHub repo as well as the source files inside the Raspberry Pi. Since I am in my exploratory days with this source code, to compare code and to make really small changes is a good way to go. For me, it's important to regularly push changes into GitHub and create tags. This acts as a checkpoint in case I need to roll back a change due to a problem. It's also a good idea to make backups of the Raspberry Pi microSD card before doing big changes. This fallback mechanism can save me from losing days of work trying to detect problems I injected inadvertently. I have learned that Clipper creates a virtual printer in the Raspberry Pi. Octopi then connects to that virtual printer, which communicates with the printer controller firmware running in the duet. Clipper translates high-level instructions into more simple ones for the actual controller of the printer, and then sends them by the GPIO connection I explained before. Arguably, this is somewhat of a waste of processing capacity of the duet, which in itself is quite powerful. In this setup, most of its features will be basically bypassed, but the benefits of Clipper and its Python-based code base make it worthwhile. The option is to program in C and C++, modifying RepRap firmware or Marlin, but I haven't touched that in more than a decade and I never grew fond of it. My first naive approach to add the access was to create arbitrary sections in the config file. That proved fruitless. 
it seems that there are only a certain number of valid sections in the configuration file. Later on, I found what's the mechanism to verify that. I will explain that during the coding video. I am going to upload to tackle coding specifics. Now, regarding the changes to the code, what do I have to know to be able to do this? I would say, you need decent programming skills in some similar language. If you understand concepts in one language, like loops, functions, variable classes, etc., well, the concepts are all the same, only the syntax changes. I have to admit, this is an oversimplification in some sense, but useful enough to face the unknown. As a really high-level summary, what I did was to pick the core XY kinematics, duplicate it, and modify the parts I need to handle two more access. It turns out that many source files had logic that was aware of the number of axes, not just the kinematics parts. It seems like the possible access Clipper allows are X, Y, and Z, as well as E for a number of extruders. I traced back all the code that is in any way using or manipulating X, Y, and Z, and added analogous logic to cater for A and B. In hindsight, I should have also added a third optional rotational axis named C. The important part is to understand what code runs where, how to add the such parts with custom code, and then to run them and see the logs come up. My first step is to add loads of output to those log files, trying to follow the logic, looking into the startup routines, how the configuration is parsed, what is done with each part of the configuration, etc. I must have run this a million times until I put together a mental picture of how things work. This approach is not the only possible one, it's just a simple and effective one. Nowadays, we can also copy and paste code in ChatGDP and ask for a quick human readable explanation. Debugging is also an option, if you know how, but that can be tricky sometimes. And I haven't looked into this option yet. And like I said, I'm not that familiar with Python. Let's jump into the physical update, shall we? First, and more obvious, you may have noticed I switched from purple PLA to green AVS. I ran out of the PLA I initially got for this project. Now I am going through the AVS spools. And here is a slightly controversial take. I genuinely don't mind AVS. Back in the day, it was a headache to print with, but my 3D printer handles it like a champ. So all things considered, I prefer the AVS feel. It's got that real plastic vibe and it's more forgiving when I experiment. Once I am settled with the final version, I will print everything again in carbon and make a proper step-by-step -step assembly video. Most of the frame updates took place in A and C. Axis A was quite a troublemaker. It was so heavy that it kept slipping. In the initial design, the motor rotational movement was concentrated in the nut and bolt inside the A axis bearing. So after several failed attempts, I tried crafting a plastic worm gear. Kind of a proof of concept since the other ideas I tried failed. No pulley size could save me from dealing with a bad design. If this holds up, I will get my hands into metal worm gears. For now, it's doing okay. Even making it all the way to the end stop and back. In any case, this is not half bad as it stands. The way I use this M5 threaded rod to make the core of the worm gear makes me trust it's going to endure more punishment than if it was just a plastic piece. It's worth noticing though that there is a fair bit of backlash and wiggle. I will have to keep improving this one for it will affect the printer resolution and quality. A quick note, I've still got to swap those bearings for the tapered roller ones I have acquired. Oh, and then stop for A and C, no, they are optical. A physical end stop meant that by the time I touch the end stop, it's either working or I am already crashing the printer, leading to a lot of reprinting of damaged parts. Fortunately, the plastic is the first thing that gives, and that's easy to replace. The optical end stops approach has been a saver, especially for the C axis, letting it rotate a full 360 degrees. Also, I have revisited the C axis design, focusing on improving that tilt. I ended up using thrust bearings since they were drastically smaller than the smallest tapered bearings I could find. Regarding those optical end stops I mentioned, the C axis was where I first tried them, and I am thrilled with the results. This whole assembly is indeed a bit heavy still. When I was moving the A gear manually, I noticed how heavier the entire rotating part gets closer to 90 degrees. I am not worried about this right now. Optimizations will come later. For the time being, if I manage to print between minus 45 and 45 degrees, I will be happy. Big reveal, I ditched those debated carbon rods for linear rails. This is a major upgrade, though I might tweak it further. As anticipated during the previous video, and by many of you in the comments, those old rods were not gonna do the trick. But we knew that already, so I made the time and replaced them as promised. 
Had I not changed those aspects of the design, I wouldn't have been able to home the printer at all. To summarize, after all that work, I've got it homing, but just not yet in the way I would like to do it. I would prefer to modify the actual G28 from the newly created kinematics in the source code and to make a foolproof homing sequence. Currently, the home routine starts by X and Y, then it moves the printing head above the expected space where the printing platform is going to be. Then A gets homed and then C. Lastly, it wraps up by homing Z. But here is the setback. I need to position the bed just underneath the printing head before sending it to home Z. But what if the initial state is such that it would make it crash if I home A before pulling Z down? That is a problem that I will leave for later. Eventually, I will have to resolve it with changes in the hardware or through some clever simultaneous move of Z and A to a safe initial position somehow in the code. That's gonna be an interesting challenge. Next steps is to go deeper into the coding part of the project. The design is likely to keep changing as well. In my immediate list for the next month, I have listed modifying the bed leveling routines, adding a proper extruder, testing out real prints, but just in the standard three axes for now. To wrap this video up, I just want to say I really appreciate the feedback in the comments. I don't publish too often since my primary focus is in the project itself, but I aim to be able to make one of those videos every few weeks. So please subscribe to see this project progress and maybe some other ones in the future. As always, comments are welcome, I read them all and I answer them as soon as I have a good answer for them. See you next time.